Kathy Martin was asking me before about maybe it's the way we wore, the way we walked or acted with these masks or the clothes we wore. Well, we had we've had probably 30 or 40 different individuals wear these masks to get these responses, and we even had people this far uh, and this far panel here shows people who didn't have any idea what we had done. We just said to students and friends, wear these masks, walk this route, tell us what the pros do. You know, write down how many times they. They come at you, write down how close you can walk up to them, a variety of measures like that. And they got the same results that we did. So it, that's what I was worried about. I didn't want to do it with, the reason we used a mask is because I wanted to have other people who, who would walk differently and, and look differently. We had kids to very old people do this and, and skinny and heavy people and all kinds of different people do this. And, if you put the right face on, the birds respond pretty strongly to you. And without that face, they don't respond. And this response has lasted a long time on campus. It still occurs today. So in 2006, February, we caught those seven birds, which are shown on the top panel there. And their response, the, the birds then that respond on campus to us has increased steadily for the next three years, basically, and still continues. In, in response to Cheney, the control face, they haven't changed. The, they have a low and variable response. So we thought, well, what about some more, you might not think these are natural looking faces, but some more natural faces than the, the funny, ex extraordinary face of the caveman. So we made uh, casts of our students and friends, took these molds from their faces, made masks, and wore these around in different places. And we did the same thing. We caught a few birds in four different places around Seattle. Each time we used a different one of these faces as the trapper, and the others were controls. And the trapper face was a control at one of the places we didn't use them for trapping. So we had a nice experiment, and we found basically the same effect. And that is shown here. The, the dark bars are the ones that are the responses to the trapping mass at the site where they trapped. And the same faces, like for example, Linda down here, where she's got a large black bar in the bottom uh, right side here, shows that where she was a trapper, she attracted mobs of crows at this particular site, but where she wasn't a trapper up above, she didn't attract much, of, much attention from the crows. So they, they seem to be able to discriminate, although they, they make mistakes. There's, you know, their responses to the non-black bars, for sure. But in general, they respond most strongly and significantly to the individual face that we use for trapping, and that varied from site to site. So the interesting thing about this also is that we only trapped seven birds and banded seven birds wearing some of these masks. And yet, we were scolded by 20, 30, 40 birds often. And they were not the birds that we trapped all the time by any means. In fact, most of the birds that scold us are ones we had never captured. And that's shown here with the, with the black bars in this case. These are birds that responded aggressively, scolding, mobbing us that we had never captured. And the ones we had captured are just shown over here. So yeah, they're very accurate. If we catch them and they see us, they scold us. But a lot of other birds are also scolding us that we're not captured. So it seems like they might be learning from either observing others being captured or observing us being scolded by other birds that have been captured or seen us make a capture. And uh, the experiment that we would do to really tease this apart what we have to do is we have to be able to show that a crow that didn't know us at all with the mask on later responds to us wearing the mask. Uh, and we know that the only way it could have learned about that mask is by seeing somebody else scold us. The problem in most of the settings, all the settings on campus that we did, is that if a bird is scolding us, other birds come in and they naturally are attracted to scolding birds. That's why they, they scold. They want to bring others in. And those other birds almost by... Um, force to join in the scolding. They can't help themselves but also scolding at that time. So just because they're scolding doesn't mean they know really what they're scolding at or why. They just know somebody was scolding, so I'm going to scold. Maybe. That's what you could argue. So what we did is we took some young birds, in this case is showing one here sitting on a, a post. We caught this bird as it was just fledged from the nest, and we did not wear a mask when we caught it. Its parents, however, were those ones in Freeway Park that we saw a second ago that were very aggressive towards us with the particular bald mask on. So we just walked by this bird was sitting in a tree. We grabbed him out of the tree. We put a radio tag on it. We took it back to its tree where it was. We let it go. It went right back in the tree. Its parents took care of it. No problem from that point on. 
But that bird never saw us do anything bad wearing a mask. Okay? But what it did see is that for the next month, we would go out there and its parents would dive us and scold us when we had that mask on. And then we could finally wait until this bird left its territory, and in this case, he's in downtown Seattle, and we can watch and see what the first thing he does when he sees the mask by himself. He's not around his parents at this point. He would scold it when he's with his parents, but that's because they were scolding, maybe, just stimulating him. This is what he did when we first saw him. So that bird did not learn from personal experience about the, the mask. It only could have learned by the experience of its parents responding to the mask. So it could have been stimulated when its parents were there, but in this case, we could track him down a few kilometers away when he was by himself once, give him the test of what, he, what is that bird going to do to the mask, and he scolded us. So for us, that was a neat, a neat thing. But it's not that unusual for crows to do these sorts of things. In, in our case, I think their ability to recognize people might be one of the reasons they are very good at getting into our culture. They engage us. They, they come, you can imagine, sitting around a campfire back in the day when ravens would come in uh, scavenging around you in the morning, trying to steal things and come in and, and really engage you in a personal way. And that might lead to some interesting beliefs you'd have about those animals. They're smart in many ways. The New Caledonia crow that's shown here, and I'll show you a quick video of that, uh, is an expert tool user. I showed you it holding its tool in nature and its lateralized brain that allows it to effectively um, use its brain power to solve problems. But in this case, they were brought into the lab and asked to solve the problem of getting food out of that clear tube, and the food is hanging in that little bucket. And the bird is given a straight piece of wire and asked to solve this problem. And I know some of you will think this is not unusual, but it was a female crow that first solved this problem. And she did it by bending this wire into the shape of a hook and using it to fetch that bucket up. She uses, she, she knew the task in this case, she, she knew the, the solution to the task, have to make a hook to get this thing out. She used another tool to make the hook. She didn't just grab it and start bending it with her bill, but she stuck it into that tube and walked it around and used leverage. And that tube is a tool itself. This is a task that monkeys don't do, that young children don't do. And uh, it shows, I think, the sort of way that these animals can use their mental abilities to solve complex and, for them, important problems, in this case, getting food. This bird uses tools well, but that's what New Caledonia crows do. They make tools and they use them. American crows might be especially good at recognizing people because they've got to live with us and deal with us on a regular basis. Ravens might use other sorts of insight to solve problems in their world. But all of the members of this group have, have demonstrated extreme abilities to learn and remember things and use them adaptively to, to live in their world. So I think we're lucky to be able to share that world uh, quite closely with them and sometimes it's really amazingly close, as is the case here with an, another, what is really an anecdote now, but I think might be something worth pursuing. So indulge me for a few minutes while I tell you this story that Gary Clark uh, told me one day about crows that were giving him gifts. He went out and he feeds crows every day. And what Gary does, he chops up chicken and potatoes and pasta and bread. Some of you others might do the same thing and take these out daily and feed them to the crows that come to his yard. And one day he went out and he said to the crows, I feed you every day and you never give me anything. And the next afternoon, that little heart-shaped piece of candy with love on it was on his bird feeder. And he sent me that email and I went, uh-huh, I know about this guy. And then uh, he showed me the other things the crows had left him. This iron butterfly, this uh, stick and, and fur cone and pieces of uh, cement and weird things that showed up on his feeder after the crows had been there.